to do it because of uh, who created the. Okay. Yep. I will get that started. Thanks. All right. I just was able to start it. So hopefully we're not going to crash the internet or something. Oh, cool. <laughs> Look at you. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, again, thanks for attending. I'm going to try to share my screen and hopefully again, the internet won't crash in the process. All right. I cannot see myself, but can everyone see this presentation on the screen? Looks good. Looks good. All right. Great. So today's presentation is going to be an intro to the buffer and buffer management plans. Quick overview. I'm going to go into uh, just basics about the critical area buffer. We're going to talk about expansion, establishment, and some mitigation. We're going to go a little bit into buffer management plans and some of the requirements. Then I'm going to hand it over to a local planner, Brian Leitner, who is going to go into some various aspects of their program and projects that they do. And then if we could hold, um, if there's a burning question that you want to jump in while we're doing the presentation, feel free to. But hopefully we can hold the Q&A until the very end of the presentation. So the critical area buffer, uh, you will find most of these regulations in Comar 2701-0901, uh, the various um, uh, Comar regulations will be listed at the top of these slides. Uh, studies have shown, obviously, that the ecological importance of buffers in terms of uh, erosion control, protection for nutrients and sediment runoff, uh, habitat, um, are very important, especially along the bay, uh, which is why we consider this particular habitat protection area to be of such vital importance to uh, the ecological health of the bay and our critical area program. As most everyone knows, the uh, critical area buffer is delineated in the field and it is based on the site conditions at the time of an application. A minimum width is 100 feet and this is measured from mean high water of tidal waters, uh, the upland boundary of tidal wetlands or from the edge or bank of perennial and intermittent tributary streams. It's uh, important, <laughs> we see this on some applications and often answer this in some questions. I'm sure um, you all might have similar experience where there is sometimes a little bit of confusion between the critical area 100 foot buffer and the thousand foot critical area boundary line so uh, it is important to there is a large difference between the two obviously and different regulations apply and it's important to get that uh, basic fact out to people when they are putting in project applications so again what's so great about the buffer um, why is this something important why do we focus on it so much as I mentioned, this reduces the amount of sediment, excess, excess nutrients, and just general harmful substances and chemicals that are gonna run off from stormwater into the bay and into streams. It can trap some of these and they can hold it and sequester it. Uh, it is of vital importance uh, if you live in Calvert County or really anywhere along the bay, it helps prevent uh, and reduce shoreline erosion. If you have a, a barren buffer, it's gonna erode much faster. And it maintains vital wildlife life habitat along the shores and streams uh, that important flyovers, uh, nurseries for different fish species and, and amphibians. If we don't have these buffers, then we don't have the animals that need them to uh, thrive. And we're gonna try to leave the page just for a second and show you on our website where you can find more information about the buffer. Can you still see me or did I lose you? We still see the slides and we still uh, see you. All right. So we don't have the buffer page. Well, <laughs> if anyone wants, if anyone goes to our website at uh, the Critical Area Commission in the, uh, on the left hand side of the web page, there will be a tab that says buffer information. And that will have all kinds of useful stuff for you in terms of uh, the green book for the buffers there. And there's also another um, resource document that you can download that will have more information, more from a regulatory perspective about. The buffer and why it's important and what uh, regulations you need to follow for it. So I'm not going to go too too far into expanded buffers because odds are in most municipalities we aren't going to encounter situations that the buffer will need to be expanded too much. But for more information on it, you'll um, find it in 27010901E7. 
the picture to the right is basically it's the it's the full monty i don't know that uh, this is a pretty special circumstance where it has like all the possible uh, reasons you would want to expand the buffer in terms of uh, non-tidal wetlands wetlands of special state concern highly erodible soils um it's got all of it so this is a, a pretty unique situation which uh, will boggle the mind if you look at it too much but as we see on the on the uh, slide buffer will be expanded for other hpas non-tidal wetlands sensitive soils such as hydric and highly erodible soils if you have steep slopes on site it'll be expanded as well and in the case of a new RCA subdivision, uh, you're gonna have to expand the buffer to 200 feet. I'm just gonna focus a little bit on um, some more detail on buffer expansion for steep slopes because this one is sometimes a little uh, confusing for, for people depending on the environmental situation. Uh, the expansion for the steep slopes of 15% or greater, so you have four feet for every 1% of steep slope. Uh, this is a pretty basic example, so you've got a uh, 100-foot buffer is contiguous to a 20% slope, therefore the buffer must be expanded by an additional 80 feet, so 4 times 20. There are some regulations, I believe, that have uh, a cutoff at like, the top of the slope is where the, the buffer will um, stop, but as is the case with all these uh, examples of buffer expansion, we highly, highly recommend that um, you coordinate with a planner in in our office um, if you have any questions about it at all just so we can work it out and um, look at the particular circumstances of the uh, buffer and what kind of environmental changes may need to be made to expand the buffer non-tidal wetlands and wetlands of uh, special state concern so for a non-tidal wetland like on tranquil cove here uh, the buffer is going to be expanded to incorporate the non-tidal wetland. Um, so that 100-foot buffer will be bumped out a little bit to include the non-tidal wetland. And MDE also has some uh, non-tidal wetland buffers that may push it out a little bit further, but that's beyond uh, critical area regulations. For the Serene Cove, we've got a wetland of spatial state concern. So the edge of the wetland of spatial state concern, the buffer is then bumped out an additional 100 feet on top of that. So once again, if there are any questions, when you, if you see a site plan come in that have that has any of this on it, then um, please reach us out to us early on so we can coordinate and we can make sure the buffer is delineated correctly on the site plan and therefore any mitigation that may occur because of that. If we expand for hydric or highly erodible soils. The, the main point for both of these situations is that uh, you have to go to the edge of the hydric soils or the highly erodible soils um, or up to 300 feet. Um, it's the lesser of the two. To determine if you have hydric soils on site or highly erodible soils, I believe there's a feature on Merlin you can go to to look at the um, potential for highly erodible soils on a site. And then there is a website you can go to um, uh, for National Soils District, which will have all the hydric soils listed for an area. If you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to a, a planner. It can be, the website can be a little tricky to navigate at times, but uh, it will provide you with all the information you need to determine if a certain area has hydric soils in it. Moving on to buffer establishment. So on waterfront lots, you're, you're going to have to, plantings are basically required for the development outside of the buffer. Again, this is not something that we would expect to see in too many municipalities based on some of the projects that we have come in. Um, but it does apply to any site that contains a buffer, an expanded buffer, requires some amount of plantings to be provided in the buffer for development that occurs outside of the buffer, and uh, new subdivisions or change in land use will require some full buffer establishment. Lesser amounts may be required for development on grandfather lots or lots with existing development. Um, excess buffer establishment can count towards, towards overall mitigation requirements for a project. Uh, once the buffer is considered fully established and the requirement is met. Um, this is not applicable all the time for an MBA component, which we will touch on a little bit later. This is a helpful table that you'll find in Comar. Uh, it's mitigation required for area of permanent disturbance in the buffer. Uh, so whether it's uh, a shore erosion control project, riparian water access, water dependent facility, you'll see the different mitigation requirements on there. Uh, variances all will always have a three to one um, on there for most cases and then violations as well. 
Uh, so this is just for the disturbance. Uh, the canopy clearing is an additional amount. So anytime we have something come in, we always try to highlight that in our comment letter that uh, the area of disturbance has one set of mitigation and then any additional canopy clearing will have another set. So we have to make sure that both of those are accounted for when the mitigation or the planting plan is submitted for us to review. Well, for management plans, uh, if you can get to the website, which I couldn't get us to uh, with this presentation, you'll see that the green book for the buffer is on there and you can download it. It's an excellent resource um, for all things buffer related. Uh, buffer management plans are required for buffer establishment or any kind of disturbance of the buffer. Uh, there are three basic types that you'll find, a simplified BMP, a minor BMP, and a major BMP. If you haven't downloaded this book, I, I strongly recommend you do and uh, it answers a lot of questions and it can be a great resource for citizens as well if they have questions about what is the buffer and uh, why is it important and what can i do to make sure that i have a decent buffer in my area on the left we've got just a kind of a, a basic schematic for a landscaping plan it's a pretty good looking buffer um, <laughs> it might not be something we see too often out in the field but uh, we also have down at the bottom, uh, a good table that kind of breaks down the species count, scientific name, size of what's going to be planted, the planting type. Uh, therefore, that kind of helps determine what the mitigation credit's going to be and the total number that could be on there. Um, this all goes hand in hand with the required information we need to see on a buffer management plan. Uh, what's existing, uh, the location, the arrangement, and quantity of the proposed planting, size, species, allotted credit, um, it makes it a lot easier if uh, we get a plan that has the credits in there um, rather than us trying to determine it ourselves. Um, existing and proposed structures, uh, the limits of disturbance, location of the buffer, properly delineated uh, if it's expanded, and the total square footage of mitigation and establishment that may be needed for the project. There are a couple other things um, that are important to have on a buffer management plan. Um, in addition to what was just mentioned. So reviewing the planting plan, the landscaping schedule, schedule credit spacing, species, et cetera. Um, it's important that in some cases, you may see a plan that has tons of plantings that are just crammed into a, a certain area. And there are recommending spacings between that to ensure or helps ensure survivability. Um, you know, like right now or not long ago, there were buffer management plans coming in that we've seen where either the local planner or we were recommending that there's postponement of the plantings because it was you know, high summer and high heat, not a lot of uh, precipitation, which could affect survivability. Um, if that's the case, that should be noted on the, on the planting plan. Review maintenance plan is extremely important. In most cases around here, you're gonna see some type of invasive species. How is that gonna be monitored and controlled uh, and should be part of the for management plan. Inspection periods, uh, how long is there gonna be an inspection period tied to the buffer management plan? How often is it gonna be taking place? And if there is some die off, uh, are there terms in there that will ensure replacement? An inspection agreement, which again, uh, ensures some kind of assessment of the growing conditions, making sure that stuff is planted in the right area, right soils. Um, for major BMPs, you have to have some kind of financial insurance or bond that's going to be there and, and make sure all those logistics are taken care of. And then uh, signatures, you know, make sure the contract is is signed, sealed, and delivered. So we're not going to go into all the other buffer regulations that you may find in Comar, but I'm just going to touch on a couple that may be applicable to uh, what you'll find in different municipalities. Uh, natural regeneration can be counted um, as a buffer management plan, but it's important that it's got a lot of numerous and specific requirements uh, that have to be met in order to include natural regeneration on your buffer management plan. Um, cannot include any new or managed turf. Uh, the natural regeneration area um, has to be within 300 feet of a mature forest or at least one acre that contains a seed bank of native species adequate for natural regeneration. Um, there has to be some financial assurance to cover the cost of planting an area equivalent to the area of natural regeneration. Um, and I believe there's like a five year date of approval on it. So there's there's a lot that is tied into including natural regeneration into your buffer management plan. If it's something you see on a site plan, highly recommend you reach out to us um, or our science advisor about it so we can offer guidance. 
Another thing we'll definitely touch on is uh, fee and lieu for buffer mitigation. Uh, this is something we've covered in various trainings before. The only stipulated requirement for a fee and lieu that is in Comar is a dollar fifty per square foot of mitigation for the buffer. Um, it is one of the basic tenets of this is that uh, you have to have a dedicated account for the fee and lieu. Um, it cannot be rolled into the general fund. Um, this is something that should only be used if you cannot plant in the buffer, directly adjacent to the buffer, or even an off-site location that's been approved and, and may help the same watershed where the project is taking place. And um, whatever fee and lieu is collected needs to be applied for very specific projects, typically like buffer projects, or um, we should coordinate with you on what type of projects are going to be applicable for fee and lieu funds that you may have in an account. So I touched on buffer management areas quickly before. Um, these are areas in the buffer uh, of the buffer that you know there was highly existing development, which prevents the buffer from fulfilling its function. Uh, so at the time of adoption of the critical area program, these areas are already highly developed. The buffer was already compromised in some way, so they have a special designation. Um, it has previously been known as the buffer exempt area, special buffer area. Um, there is often kind of a misnomer that if it's a, a buffer exempt area, that means that none of the regulations for the buffer apply. That is not the case. Uh, there is always going to be some type of regulation that acquired that is applied to the buffer, even if it's a BMA. Um, it's important to note that uh, with this, a local jurisdiction can request an exemption from certain portions uh, for buffer management areas. Um, it would come to the commission and then it would be approved. But in this circumstance, the uh, local jurisdiction has the ability to kind of craft their own language um, for the buffer management area and, and implement um, something that's going to be beneficial for the local jurisdiction because we have recommendations about what has to happen in a buffer management area, but if it comes into us for review, we can work with a municipality about um, how a designated BMA or MBA, modified buffer area, um, can be worked into their program. So if there is something that is under consideration, uh, this gives the town the flexibility to kind of write their own regs. So we do have like some guidance documents that will help and some policies that will help, but um, having a, a BMA or MBA uh, put into effect gives the local jurisdiction some flexibility. And I have uh, gone through all the, the regulatory stuff. I, I hope some of that was a good refresher for you all. I'll emphasize once again, um, if there are any questions when you get a site plan that comes in, um, any questions about like buffer expansion or, or what's going on in a modified buffer area or BMA, just contact us and we'll be more than happy to help you out with that. So now I will stop sharing and hand it over to Brian Leitner from Charlestown. Thanks, Mike. Um, let me see if I can pull up my presentation here. See, it looked like someone maybe had a question for Mike. I don't know if we wanted to. Yeah, I, I did have a quick question, if I could just do it now. Were you sure, talking, Kevin. This is Kevin Scott. You are talking about MBA and BMA. Are they two different, is, the same, is that the same word for? It, it's all the same know? thing. Yeah, it's all we the same thing. You started calling them modified buffer areas, and you were calling buffer management areas. Yeah, it's it's all what, the same thing. It's It's been called BEA in the past, um, right. so modified buffer area, buffer management area. It's, it's all the same thing in terms of what it is. It's just had a few different uh, a few different names over the years. Yeah, but what's the name that is the universal name? Is it modified buffer areas? Modified buffer areas. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's what we're trying to gear all the all the language to currently. Thanks, Kate. Hey, Mike, will you be able to share uh, my presentation? I can't get it uh, uploaded. Yeah, stand by. Let me. Uh, it wouldn't be a good Zoom presentation if there wasn't some kind of uh, technical difficulty, right? So I do have it. Yeah, just stand by.
Bear with me. Yeah, I apologize. It was, uh, you know, when it's letting me look at things to share, it was like my, my browser, my web browser, but it wasn't my PowerPoint. It wasn't an option. <laughs> I'm not a regular Teams user, so I guess it doesn't recognize me. Okay, no problem, no problem. All right, we'll try this again. And uh, just let me know when you want to advance. Cool, we'll do. Thank you, Mike. All right, I know this is just the kind of PDF view, but can people see it? I can see it okay. Yep, looks good. All right. <laughs> All right, so um, thanks, guys, for inviting me to chat a little bit about my experience, um, just to give you all some background. Um, I previously worked for Harford County for eight years as a critical area planner. Um, after that experience, uh, worked for Cecil County for, for four years. And, uh, now, now I'm here in the town of Charlestown. I've been here about a year now. Um, on, on slide two, Mike is, uh, I guess where we're at. Um, I guess the main thing I wanted to get across to everybody, uh, and, you know, just as background and. Uh, kind of in the beginning, my my years of experience, I think, have instilled in me um, kind of the two main goals that I take away from from the critical area program, and it's um, um, I'll say uh, multifaceted regulations. Um, we're you know we have these regulations because we're always trying to improve water quality and enhance wildlife development or wildlife habitat no matter what kind of development might be uh, proposed um, and no matter what kind of condition the, the land might be in uh, to start uh, before development. So uh, uh, next, please. So in Charlestown, just to give you some background uh, about us, the population's around 1,500. Uh, we are primarily residential. Uh, we have two restaurants and four marinas, an elementary school, a fire company, and a and a church. And uh, um, the rest of us is uh, primarily, uh, I'll, I'll even say, uh, single family residential use. Um, part of what makes Charlestown, I think, a little unique is is its historic nature. Um, I think we have visions of one day becoming more like colonial Williamsburg uh, because of our colonial history that has been preserved uh, pretty neatly and in, in, in especially within our uh, National Register Historic District in, in the downtown. Um, what also makes us kind of unique is we have some, some natural beauty uh, along the river. We have five, uh, we have five parks that are held within in a Maryland Environmental Trust easement. And if you, I think if you looked at one park by itself, um, I don't know if that would typically be, be placed in that sort of protective easement with, with MET, but because we have five of them in a row, rough of, roughly, uh, I'll say, three or four block area, uh, a stretch of shoreline, I think uh, the MET viewed value in in preserving them kind of as a group. So we have lots of 100-foot uh, buffer, I'll say, uh, that we are, are stewards of. And uh, we're always balancing, you know, preserving uh, nature and, and trying to enhance wildlife habitat as well as providing uh, public access that I think folks in town but throughout the region have, have come to appreciate. Um, I think most towns on the call probably have heard about the Sustainable Community Program through the State Department of Housing and Community Development. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, that's a great program. Uh, we do also have a green team here in town, which is fun to be a part of. 
because uh, there's always projects to do. There's always land to try to improve. Um, and then uh, finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the Arbor Day Foundation. Uh, it's a program, Tree City USA. We, we are striving to meet those four criteria, um, you know, maintaining a, a tree board and having some kind of a community tree ordinance. I do believe uh, the critical area regulations themselves qualify for that ordinance. Um, I can tell you we certainly do spend at least $2 per capita on taking care of our trees and uh, I'll say developed woodlands and forests. And we do uh, look to hold a uh, an Arbor Day event wherever possible. So uh, next, please. And this is just an example of what I think is kind of unique in Charlestown that we try to do is uh, in thinking about trying to create events that are attractive, not just to residents, but to folks in the region trying to combine two um, interesting, uni unique aspects of town. There's a green team sponsored event we held uh, last year, com just combining uh, a little bit of historic preservation, uh, a, a tour that involved a little bit of historic preservation and horticulture. Um, and when we have professionals combining forces to put on an event like that, we think it's it's uh, pretty enriching. Uh, next. So just to talk a little bit about sustainable community, um, there's a map there, I think, the latest towns and cities that are in the program. Um, really, I, th I think it incentivizes good planning when you get this designation. It usually is just a portion of the town. Um, just as an example, one one program that's set up, uh, once you get this revitalization designation established, is um, facade improvement. So, and I think that's something uh, we can all appreciate. Um, the last bullet there in regards to uh, the program is, um, you know, we're trying to make sure growth and development practices protect the environment, conserve air, water, and energy resources, encourage walkability and recreation opportunities. Next. And just as part of that plan, um, th there's different themes, you know, related to environment is just an example here, um, but, you know, related to transportation, uh, land use, housing. In our environment theme, we that's why the, the there's a photo there, the scolding finger. We, we kind of tell ourselves uh, what we plan to do over the next five years, right? And it's good to remember uh, remember these things and to revisit them often uh, as a team. Um, first project there, or first uh, strategy rather, is uh, implementing green infrastructure projects so that we can create some demonstration projects, and not just at our parks. Uh, our elementary school is a green school. Uh, so they are also partnering with us on these sorts of projects. Um, our, our church and our fire company, I would view as other institutions where we're trying to do more of these. Um, and when I say green infrastructure, I mean, um, you know, like a rain garden, which is not uh, too big or uh, too deep that it would require uh, under drains or, or complicated engineering and pipes. Um, cisterns and even just conservation landscaping, a wildflower meadow or um, tree plantings. Um, and there there are two types. Uh, I'll get into the other type of green infrastructure below. But um, next strategy, we tell ourselves to not forget. Oh, sorry, uh, Mike, <laughs> not the next slide yet. Um, next bullet on this slide is just um, we have a public boat ramp in town, as well as a uh, public dock, and our fire company has a fire boat dock. All three of those water-dependent facilities need dredging from time to time, and we know we'll want to maintain those and, you know, in perpetuity. What can we do with those spoils that are removed from maintaining those three facilities over time? Um, we're hopeful that since we have five waterfront parks and we're trying to preserve um, their shorelines, we may be able to reuse some of those spoils for 
for living shorelines and again as demonstration projects ways to protect your land without uh, armoring the shoreline typically what's done with the uh, riprap and revetment um, we are the third bullet there we are continuing to try to improve the management of our parks uh, creating those native plant demonstration gardens i'll call them uh, wherever possible also um, to help reduce nuisance flooding wherever we can uh, we we certainly we're an older town and we don't have uh, an elaborate stormwater management system so there's areas where uh, pieces are missing and we may be able, may be able to help uh, develop runoff away from um, private properties that are flooded just within our road right of way putting in a swale or maybe a pipe into a uh, one of our parks where we have a little bit more land to help uh, store that that runoff, uh, the, the volume of that runoff. Um, we certainly do want to try to create incentives for folks to do these sorts of green stormwater infrastructure projects on their own properties. We don't have, I know some towns have uh, stormwater utility fees. We don't have anything like that. So, you know, what are our options if we'd like to get uh, folks to do more of these projects? We, we start with just the, you know, having conversations with folks well maybe it's yeah you know, it's like street cred or peer pressure you know if your neighbor's doing it maybe maybe you know you should do it too um so we're in, you know i don't know if we'll get to a point where we may actually reduce people's property taxes for for doing projects but we wait we may so we'll see how that goes um next bullet is regarding the green infrastructure network this is you know if you're looking at it at a regional level basically an interconnected system of, of forests and floodplains, uh, hydrology. We feel like even in town, uh, you can look at these sorts of networks. Oftentimes counties establish them and uh, they don't exclude the towns when they do those sorts of regional studies. So if you look at that within your town, you know, are there things that we can do to um, kind of take maybe some of the critical, critical area regulations and apply it to this network outside of the 1,000 foot boundary, uh, just clearing limits and, and mitigation requirements, basically. Because we do feel like it's an important part of our uh, town fabric. And then lastly is just, uh, again, long range plans that we have, trying to incorporate some of these strategies into them, especially the, I know the comprehensive plan is kind of like an encyclopedia, uh, but whenever we I looked update, even if it's just sections of it, not a wholesale update, but just sections that we try to look to incorporate these elements related to green infrastructure, nuisance flooding, and also hazard mitigation. Next. So back to the 100 foot buffer. Um, in my mind, it's, you know, it's not just that, uh, like what Mike was showing earlier, the 100 foot buffer from the river and uh, tidal wetlands, but the creeks that drain into the river, um, especially as waterfront towns, I know we, we have two or three or four of them. Um, I think it's important to uh, try to maintain or try to become a riparian forest buffer along those areas as well. And it's not just, you know, the, the buffer regulations tend to be the most strict, uh, and it's not just to protect wildlife it's to uh, I think there's benefits here I've listed uh, for us humans too you know trees are good in, in a lot of different ways and, and also I'd say forest in general um, things we I think we need to remind ourselves you know how important they are you know it can reduce traffic sounds uh, cools the air reduces energy costs uh, can increase property values I think it improves our mental and physical health and absorb some of the carbon dioxide in the air and i think it mitigates the effects of climate change so whatever we can do to try to improve the 100 foot buffer no matter what condition it might be in and even if it's just planting a tree in in lawn uh, i think there are benefits for for all of us uh, next so even in uh, whatever we want to call them, the modified buffer areas is, is what I labeled it as. 
um, again, there's there's room for improvement there. Um, I know in Charlestown, we actually have a, a 50 foot setback, uh, which is basically considered a, a non-disturbance zone. And we know because it's a modified buffer area that uh, there could already be some disturbance there, but to kind of come at it from a mindset of uh, when new development's proposed, what can we do to um, improve the modified buffer areas as well? And I think it's, you know, you're trying to keep development out of that 50-foot setback if, if at all possible. And if there is development that you, um, you know, try to establish that 50-foot setback. And when I say establish, that means try to direct your uh, tree and shrub and any kind of mitigation landscaping into that zone. I, I know it's a real popular question. Um, you know, when a when a resident might first learn about the the critical area program, and they say, "Oh, I have to plant a tree because I'm taking down a hazard tree, or I have to, um, you know, put in some trees and shrubs because I'm I'm building a, a shed." Uh, wh where should I put it on my property? You know, they often ask us that, right? And um, I think the common answer is, you know, wherever it, or maybe the safest answer, I should say, is wherever it, uh, it could go on your property that would make you the most happy to live with in the future, right? Um, but I think we always want to try to give that guidance to help help folks realize the importance of that, of the buffer, and try to try to do that landscape and mitigation there if, if they can, and, they, and they'd be happy with it. Um, I remember working on a, a project that was in Cecil County where the house is really close to the river and it was a steep slope. It was, a, it was basically a retaining wall that was almost 20 feet tall and they had their dock down below and there was really not much room um, as part of replacing that retaining wall to do their landscape and mitigation. So they, they had actually asked if they could do uh, rain gardens instead. Um, I just think that's an interesting thing to consider and, and probably should be in, in local uh, programs or regulations that, as an option. You know, folks just can't fit their landscape and mitigation in the buffer on that site. Could they do some kind of stormwater BMP instead? Um, and uh, on the photo here, I, I, I think there are values in installing rain gardens, even if it's just a a small depression in the ground with a little berm on the downhill side of it. It doesn't have to be engineered and, um, you know, you replace it with some soil that'll infiltrate and put some plants on top. But I do think that there's value in installing those um, even on small, small sites. And then I, I do know in our uh, critical area ordinance, we do accept a, a fee in lieu. Sometimes there's uh, development projects that just, again, because of site constraints, can't fit the mitigation on there. Uh, they end up having to pay a fee in lieu. I know uh, we allow that in modified buffer areas as well as in the LDA section of the critical area. And that can become a good funding source uh, for towns to use uh, on their parks when they're trying to um, naturalize them. Next. And with the 10% the rule, I know in Charlestown, most of our cr uh, critical, critical area designation is IDA. Um, so 10% rule comes up all the time. We had um, uh, a project I'll get into in a little bit where we preferred planting trees instead of putting in stormwater practices. So it's kind of vice versa. If you have um, the room to put in trees at, at uh, for example, one of our parks, that could be an option to consider too. And and just to remember that the environmental site design, the, the stormwater regulations, uh, even though there can be some intense engineering involved, it's meant to mimic woods in good condition. So um, again, just to kind of reinforce, I'd say the importance of, of forest and developed woodlands wherever possible. Next. This is the uh, uh, one out of our four or five uh, natural parks along the river we just purchased from a marina uh, about 10 years ago. 
So um, we've been actively naturalizing it. Our green team spends a lot of time on it. There's actually uh, this Saturday, October 1st, coming up in two weeks, uh, Cecil Cares Day for this year. It's a community or a countywide day of service. This is where we'll be focusing our efforts, um, cleaning up debris, maintaining the gardens, and planting some additional trees and shrubs. Not for this particular project, but for um, it's just something we, we want to continue doing. But for this particular project, we put in two gravel parking lots. The, the upper parcel is where our boat trailers park. We use our public boat ramp. The parking lot down below is near uh, an entertainment stage that we have. Um, and so as mitigation for the parking lots, again, it's the 10% the 10 10 rule kicks into play. There's the ESD spreadsheet that you need to think about as far as uh, the footprint of the development and how much uh, nutrient pollution uh, removal we're trying to get. And then just to do a calculation, we, we had figured out how many trees and shrubs we needed to plant to satisfy that uh, requirement. So the fun thing about that is, and these trees are all on the ground now, but just um, last Arbor Day in April, uh, we partnered with the fifth graders at the elementary school uh, to plant the trees. So that was our Arbor Day event for the year. And we'll, you know, we're always looking for Arbor Day events. Next. Again, with uh, Avalon Park, we're, we're naturalizing. Um, we're still holding events there. That's a picture of our stage. Um, you know, still maintaining the park uh, for public use, but also taking care of it from a uh, natural habitat standpoint. Uh, we do, we've hired, I, I know the town of Northeast, and I think the city of Havit of Grace uh, used Jody Shivery. Her, her company is called Ecologically Sound Landscapes. And I can't stress enough how important it is to find a really good gardener uh, in your area to help you take care of your parks. Um, you know, not only is Jody a licensed herbicide applicator, but she's really passionate about uh, getting rid of the bad plants and spreading more of the good plants. And when I say good plants, I mean native bad is obviously the invasives. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm hoping that residents will start to appreciate the turnover uh, in, in our parks. Um, you know, seeing this sort of natural environment uh, thriving. It's, it, you know, we're going to try to continue to educate folks about it, but um, visually, I think folks uh, can appreciate natural beauty. So, one thing I, I want to emphasize us towns, I think we, we have a really good opportunity. I know we talk to our residents a lot. You know, we send them utility bills, we send them newsletters and email blasts and uh, I just think we have a really good opportunity to maybe change some of our residents' behaviors in, in that sort of natural habitat regard and, uh, I'd say, appreciation of, of native plants. Uh, next. And one thing, uh, just to follow up on the, the dredge spoils uh, strategy that we have for ourselves, uh, we are looking at this particular park to possibly use some of those spoils for a living shoreline project. Um, you know, not only could it kind of create an interesting little uh, fishing fishing access uh, and habitat right there, but it's a more sustainable way, we think, to preserve the shoreline. The, you can see there's a bulkhead to the northwest there. Um, that section where we want to put the living shoreline is that uh, is a section of bulkhead that, that's actually failing. So we have to do something about it. Um, and it's just a matter of time, I think, till we get the stars to align to get our funds together to to do a demonstration project like that. We're excited to um, get that under our belt. Next. Uh, just to reiterate, you know, I think the importance of green infrastructure planning, I think counties are doing this, trying to preserve the corridors across the region. Um, Take a look at them, you know, when you can find that data, take a look at them in your town and see what you can do to help keep them intact or, or enhance them. Uh, next. 
uh, the town is excited now. It's involved with a uh, watershed master plan. We received some funding from DNR's Chesapeake and Coastal Service. Um, you'll see in the middle of that, that's a 12-digit water uh, sub-watershed, the, the black boundary. And then the town, and that's about eight square miles, that study area. The town's only two square miles. And if you look even closer at it, there's probably only three creeks that from outside of town actually drain, drain through the town. Um, but we're interested in, um, you know, analyzing the future impacts of, uh, we'll say, extreme precipitation and what that looks like, not only on the surface when you're looking at that eight square mile study area, but also within the town, the, the subsurface, the, the stormwater pipes that we have, because we easily, you easily see the nuisance flooding in towns related to our drainage system. And I know a lot of it is just unclogging the pipes, but um, understanding what else we might be able to do to uh, reduce that nu nuisance flooding, not not just on town roads, but also uh, private properties. So um, we'll be partnering with a firm, uh, Dewberry, who's done this sort of modeling in the past for uh, adjacent jurisdictions. And part of this uh, part of this plan, uh, it's going to help us identify restoration projects uh, that we can put in the ground to help help reduce that flooding and also just think about our current stormwater and, and floodplain regulations. Um, and you know, are there areas of I'll say that green on the map there? That is the green infrastructure network. Are there uh, creative ways for us to uh, preserve that land so that it? continues to stay intact and because being intact helps reduce future flooding um, even though we know a lot of that is outside of the county we're gonna we're gonna bring the county along with us on this particular study uh, to have some of those conversations about I'll say green infrastructure network preservation but also um, putting in maybe some detention basins higher up in the in the watershed to help reduce the flow of water downstream uh, next. Again, I think something that happens at the uh, regional or the county level is nuisance flooding. Uh, there are strategies in those plans that I think we should keep in mind. Um, next. I see we're running out of time. I'm going to try to wrap up here. Um, natural floodplains, too. I think what we have to remember is they're important community assets, kind of like the 100 foot buffer. Uh, I, I wish we had more uh, regulations as far as leaving them in their natural state where they're not already developed or uh, making them more natural uh, when they are developed. So I think, uh, Mike, that's it. My next slide says thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate you listening to me chat. Thanks, Brian. That was that was great. Um, really really appreciate you taking the time to put this presentation together and share it with everyone and um i i thought there was just a lot of excellent information there uh, particularly just you know what what um planner can do at the town level i i always personally feel like um you know towns are kind of on the front line of, of what we can do um, for critical area programs and and i think we can see some of the uh, most direct impacts uh, of, of preservation and conservation um, at the town level and, and we're looking at stuff like stormwater management and um, you know doing these projects in parks to help combat shore erosion control you know do shore erosion control projects uh, you see that the effects of it um, quickly at a town level um, so thanks for that and uh um, definitely a lot in there to chew on. Um, I know this is being recorded, but we can also send out this PDF to anybody who's uh, interested in uh, having Brian's presentation. So with that, we still have a few minutes left and um, I just wanted to open up the floor to any questions or comments uh, people may have about anything I covered earlier or anything Brian touched on, if you have any questions for him. I, uh, it's Bruna here with the city of Baltimore. I have one quick question for Brian. Um, I saw the watershed master plans there. Are you guys in the CRS program? Unrelated question, like to critical area, but you're muted, Brian. 
sorry, um, we are not in the CRS program, but we would love to be. And we know that that plan will get us some points if we do. So <laughs> that's points. one of our goals. <laughs> nice. Yeah. We So the city of Baltimore is trying to pursue that uh, for a class four. So maybe we can connect offline to talk about that. Thank you. Great work there. Thanks. Thanks, Bruno. Did anybody else have any follow-up questions or comments? If not, um, I want to thank Brian once again. Um, this recording should be posted on our website in the relatively near future. If anybody wants a, a copy of, of the slides that uh, we presented so you can uh, kind of dive deeper into some of the projects that Brian mentioned or any of the information that I brought up during my presentation about the regs, please let me know or you can just reach out to your um, contact here at the commission. Our next presentation, I believe, is going to be taking place on uh, Thursday, October 20th. And um, that will be hosted by Annie. And we'll have more information coming out on that in terms of agenda and uh, what to expect. So hopefully we'll see you all there. Thanks again for taking time out today and attending the training.